go for it, interrupt away. Um, that's the fun of a, a, a group this size and, and um, that you know goes double uh, for anyone that um, is actually from the region and has made wine there and uh, can speak to it um, more profoundly than, than I'd be able to. Um, I'm gonna wait for folks, we're at 18 participants, which is very exciting. Uh, did everyone get, uh, receive uh, their, their wines and uh, hugely traditional Slovenian Italian seven layer dip? <laughs> I didn't get the dip. No dip. <laughs> what? It didn't. It, we we couldn't. We couldn't ship that to Mexico City. Oh, uh, okay. Yes. See how you see how you are, Vaughn. Muted. <laughs> I apologize wholeheartedly. Um, I'll be back in a second. The I didn't realize so seven layer dip I was doing like didn't appear until like the the eighties. It was like a, <laughs> like the early eighties. It appeared in like an issue of Good Housekeeping or something. Um, I, that doesn't mean that there wasn't seven layer dip before that, uh, but. Uh, in terms of like the Oxford English Dictionary etymological origins of seven layer dip, that is the first published mention of seven layer dip. Uh, we uh, went in a Italian Slovenian direction. So John and I have this conversation a lot that, you know, all food is the subject of, or is the, you know, outgrowth of the kind of, you know, cultural interactions that happen in border areas. So it seemed fitting for us to take that a step further and uh, run with the uh, Tex-Mex slash Slovenian American or Slovenian uh, Italian thing. So that was the inspiration for the dip. And we thought it'd be fun with the wines. Um, for the sake of everyone at home, we're gonna start with the Mexicans. Um, I have uh, the Palaflox uh, Mission Rosado um, and uh, the Vici um, uh, Prama Roja here. Um, they are making wine kind of in the same milieu um, in uh, the uh, Valle de Guadalupe. Um, the cool kids say the Valle. So if you want to sound like a, a, a hip um, young Mexican, say, you know, the Valle. Um, we're going to start there. Uh, but um, I just wanted to thank, uh, first and foremost, uh, Jason and Vaughn uh, for assembling uh, this virtual uh, hangout. I'm really excited about this topic. I was a Latin American history major. I never graduated, I was a terrible student. Um, uh, it's it's a, a topic that I find hugely compelling and very interesting and, um, you know, uh, really, you know, tried to run with for the sake of, of this event. Uh, if you have multiple uh, glasses at home, um, you know, I find it fun to taste wines beside one another. So we're going to consider wines, you know, in parallel. So we're going to start with the Rosalo and the, the um, uh, the La Prama Roja, um, and we're going to compare this side by side, and I, I find it's useful to have wine as dramatic foils, uh, one for the other. So, um, you know, if you can, uh, I think it's informative to do this, do the same uh, at home. Uh, please don't wait for my prompting to drink. Um, if you're doing so, you know, drink away, uh, have fun with this. Um, I guess it is a school night, but, you know, uh, it's a respectable time to drink, so <laughs> even, even in Mexico City. Um, or especially in Mexico City. Um, uh, for fans of Tail Coat Wine School, you will know that we always begin with um, a bit of verse, and uh, we're going to do the same uh, today. We're going to start with uh, a, a poem from a Chicano poet uh, who was a poet laureate. So he's poet laureate um, uh, when uh, Donald Trump won the election, which is fucking amazing to me. We have a Chicano poet laureate um, uh, when, when Trump was elected, and um, this is from a larger poem uh, that he wrote called uh, Border Bus, his name Juan Felipe Herrera. Uh, freedom comes from deep inside. All the pain of the world lives there. The second we cleanse that pain from our guts, we shall be free. And in that moment, we have to fill ourselves up with all the pain of all beings to free them, all of them. The guard is coming well. Now what? Maybe they'll take us to another detention center. We'll eat. We'll have a floor, a blanket, toilets, water, and each other for a while. No somos nada, y de nivel esté la nada. Pero ese nada lo es todo, si la nutres de amor. Por eso venceremos. Uh, we are nothing and we come from nothing. But that nothing is everything if you feed it with love. That is why we will triumph. We are everything, hermana, because we come from everything. Um, I, I love that bit of verse, the, the full poem, um, uh, equally. Uh, beautiful in its own right, and uh, there is an amazing, um, uh, you know, wealth of, of Chicano and Mexican poetry um, uh, that deals with, you know, this very subject, um, the border. Um, uh, when you guys 
uh, first reached out to me about doing this, the um, you know uh, kind of mandate you know was a, a pair of questions: um, uh, How can wine be defined by borders, be they nat uh, national, political, uh, cultural, what have you? Uh, and how can wine help um, reframe our thinking about identity uh, and border? And uh, this was to some extent uh, prompted by uh, this project called Borderless Wines. Um, that was kicked off by this bloke. This is a gentleman named Peter Wellman. Um, and uh, he kind of had this whole vision for, um, you know, wine uh, connoisseurship as basically a driver of, of social justice, which I think is super cool. So uh, he, you know, thought about, you know, uh, wine buyers as individual actors that are, you know, not only, um, you know, deciding what to drink on an individual night, but just defining basically like who to support and through the action of, uh, the invisible hand, hopefully, you know, making the world a, a better place. So he says, you know, wine buying can truly be a form of activism where purchases uh, can help advance regional peace, give regions economic stability uh, from a prosperous wine trade, provide support for farmers in war-torn regions, have a voice in geopolitics, aid in economic recovery, and give insight into many hard to access places. If you keep an open mind to where great wine comes from, then that can trickle into an open mindfulness into all parts of your life. And, um, you know, I, I like that notion. Um, uh, that said, you know, uh, I decided to take this class in a slightly different direction that felt a little more, um, you know, consistent with the, the field of border studies. Um, you know, and, and wine, uh, as we, you know, think of it, you know, is hugely concerned with borders. Um, one of my favorite wine writers, this English bloke, um, Oxford, or Cambridge Don, I forget where he went to school. Um, but, uh, you know, he said essentially that wine is a map. Um, and, you know, as such, borders are hugely um, important, especially in the old world, uh, to uh, defining uh, what we drink. You know, uh, in the old world, that is to say on the continent, the European continent, they tend to think of wine as expressive of an individual place. And uh, when they legislate wine, when they regulate wine, they do so geographically and they are drawing borders. So to say that you drink Sancerre, to say that you drink Chablis, to say that you drink Bordeaux, those are border defined regions, you know? And, and the French in particular, um, you know, gave rise to that system. They didn't invent it. Um, but, you know, if we were really, you know, talking wine and borders, um, you know, essentially, I'd give you a tour de force of the French Appalachian system, and maybe we trace it to its roots in Tokai, in the Douro Valley, or we could do a history of uh, vineyards of Burgundy, etc. Uh, but that would probably bore everyone to tears, um, and it wouldn't touch on a lot of the, you know, political and cultural forces that make the field of border uh, study so interesting. So um, we're taking a different track, um, you know, kind of uh, more in line with the, the work of the, of the, uh, the Institute. Um, and we're looking at, at wines from uh, a pair of borderlands and we're thinking, you know, what does it mean to make wine, uh, you know, on the littoral, you know, between one entity and another um, and between places, between peoples, between cultural forces, between economic entities, you know, how does that inform the wine and how does the wine itself inform the place and the people um, that exist uh, in uh, these, you know, crossroads in these border areas. And um, I found some really cool uh, writing uh, on, uh, borders, uh, particularly, um, you know, poets uh, writing about uh, borders. And um, I really like this quote. This is from a Poetry International Forum. Obviously, there's been a, a lot of, um, you know, writing on this topic uh, for obvious reasons, because, you know, until a couple months ago, um, we were, you know, ruled over by a racist fascist um, uh, who, uh, you know, um, had a, a, a problematic relationship with the U.S. border. But um, you know, a lot of the thinking that came out of that is, is really, you know, fascinating. So this is uh, Philip Mestris, uh, born in the U.S., but he says he considers the etymology of border. So the word border comes from an old French word, uh, bordure, meaning seam edge of the shield border. Um, uh, indeed, a border is often a shield's edge. It was uh, first used uh, to refer to the border between England and Scotland in the 16th century. Um, and, you know, that's what I typically think of, a line that separates two countries. Um, uh, Gloria uh, Alzaldúa, uh, in her book, uh, she, uh, you know, writes that the U.S.-Mexican border es una herida abierta, uh, which is a great Mexican expression, essentially means an open wound, uh, where the third world grates against the first and bleeds, and before a scab forms, it hemorrhages again. The lifeblood grates against the first and, and bleeds, and before the scab can form, it hemorrhages again. The lifeblood of two worlds merging to form a third country of border culture. 
Um, and, and I like the idea of, you know, the wound constituting the scar tissue that is something else entirely. So you have, you know, the two countries joined, um, reacting to one another, um, often at opposition, but, you know, um, often, um, you know, acting in, you know, these very poetic and synergistic kinds of ways um, that inform the place and the people uh, that, you know, come together um, in these uh, zones. Um, so we're going to consider first um, the Mexican um, American border. Um, and uh, that has everything to do, um, you know, with uh, the history of both countries. Uh, there was no uh, Mexican American border before there was essentially a Mexico um, and uh, uh, a, uh, a US. Um, Mexico um, gained its history or gained its independence um, after ours, after we did rather, um, uh, and kind of the, the death rattle of the um, Spanish Empire uh, in 1820. Um, and at that point, uh, there really wasn't much of a defined, um, you know, Mexican border uh, as such. Um, it existed as an idea. Um, you know, there was uh, a, a legal reality drawn in the map, but, um, you know, the idea of the border existed mostly in people's minds and was very fluid otherwise. Um, and the border region uh, between Mexico um, and the United States was, was hugely um, underpopulated, uh, except by um, uh, American Indian uh, inhabitants. Um, but uh, the Mexican government actually spent quite a bit of time trying to um, essentially populate um, the, um, its, its border areas. Um, and uh, initially, uh, when American settlers um, spread their way from Texas uh, into um, Mexican land, uh, the Mexican government uh, felt very good about it. They encouraged um, uh, the original Texans uh, to populate um, their state because they thought they would bring order there and they thought they would um, guard against these, uh, you know, incursions that they'd be experiencing from American Indians. But that quickly um, went awry uh, for the Mexicans. Um, slavery uh, was illegal, actually, uh, in, in Mexico, um, uh, had long since been. Um, and uh, the Texans uh, wanted to extend slavery um, into um, what they called their domain uh, in Texas. And um, James Polk basically manufactured a border crisis which led to the Mexican-American War, which led to Mexico essentially losing all of its territory. Um, you have the Lone Star uh, Republic established uh, uh, very briefly. You have the Great Bear Republic established in, in Sonoma, California. Um, but uh, by uh, 1848, um, the U.S.-Mexico border takes the shape that we uh, know today, um, with the exception of the Gadsden Purchase. But uh, for the zone that we're considering, um, you know, uh, Baja, you know, that border uh, dates uh, from um, uh, the, the treaty that uh, ended uh, the Mexican-American uh, uh, War. And uh, it's fascinating in the context of the Mexican wine scene in particular, um, because uh, the major Mexican wine zone is essentially along the border. Um, so uh, I mentioned uh, the Valle de Guadalupe. Um, it is right here. So you can see Tijuana um, uh, on the Mexican side of the San Diego-Tijuana border. Uh, the uh, uh, Valle de Guadalupe, which again, the cool kids call just the Valle, is about uh, 110 uh, kilometers uh, south of, of the border. So easy days ride, right, um, uh, certainly. Um, I was talking to uh, my good friend, uh, Mike Latiri about um, uh, the Valle, and it has become um, and, and been, uh, you know, built up over the last couple of decades. Historically, uh, there was uh, a winemaking uh, industry there. Um, uh, you know, people have been making uh, wine in Mexico since Cortez first landed there. Um, he quickly uh, drank through his supply of European wine and planted um, the vinifer grapes that he brought. Um, the grape that most fine wine comes from actually hails from the old world. Uh, the new world, Mexico had grapes of its own, but they tend not to make great wine. Um, Cortez quickly planted um, uh, European vinifer grapes, and one of the first grapes that uh, the subsequent Spanish missionaries brought over um, is called uh, Pais uh, Mission um, uh, Listan Prieto in, in the Canary Islands, and uh, it goes into the first wine that we're going to taste here. So um, we're tasting a rosé, um, and it's from a grape in Mission that was one of the first varietals uh, brought over by um, Spanish missionaries in the 16th century. Now, there's not an uninterrupted line from the um, you know, 16th century through to the modern era in the Valle de Guadalupe. Um, again, you're dealing with a border zone that wasn't um, heavily populated. Um, and, and Mexico has, has dealt with that 
for the sake of this northern regions for a long time. Um, you know, the a lot of these border cities, uh, Tijuana especially, didn't um, really you know kind of see a, a huge boom in population until prohibition. So you know, Tijuana and, and the thriving you know kind of uh, nightlife there is very much an outgrowth of U.S. Uh, prohibition. Um, uh, subsequently, the the growth in the wine culture in the Valle de Guadalupe um, has a lot to do with proximity to San Diego. Um, you know, there are a lot of gringos uh, going down there. Um, and it helps that uh, uh, the Valle um, is cartoonishly uh, beautiful. Um, I'm gonna pull up a picture here. Um, it's, this is like resorty, but you get the idea. Um, you know, there's your infinity pool. Um, you know, you're a gringo coming down for a long weekend from San Diego. You're paying in, um, you, know, uh, you know, Mexican pesos as opposed to US dollars. Um, uh, the food is preposterously delicious. Some of the best chefs in the country who train all around the world and are opening up out outposts in Barcelona and you know Chicago and everywhere else, you know, um, you know, are, are based here. Um, some make wine here. Um, in the case of the Vici, uh, that we're going to try in just a second. Um, so, you know, it's a very attractive place uh, for visitors. But you know, as far as you know, this kind of sense of local culture goes, it was funny talking to my friend um, uh, Mike. You know, who's saying that? You know, there aren't really um, you know multiple generational uh, you know, Tijuanans, uh, Bahins. Um, th there, there are a few, um, but, you know, it is a region uh, that, you know, even uh, within Mexico, um, you know, has seen a lot of migration from other parts of the country. And Baja historically, you know, has been kind of an artist colony uh, refuge of sorts that's been pretty diverse. Um, in the modern era, in terms of the history of the Guadalupe, um, the first plantings there in the modern era were actually a Russian Christian sect um, uh, in the beginning of the 20th century. Um, that uh, found refuge uh, in the Valle de Guadalupe. Um, and uh, producers like Beachy have taken advantage of that um, uh, to revive some of these older vines. Um, this is not from old vines, the Beachy wine. So the first one um, uh, comes from a, a third generation family estate. Um, uh, pretty cool for the sake of the, the Palaflox. Um, it's actually made by a female winemaker. Um, this is actually the consultant, not the winemaker. This is Lulu Martinez, um, that does some of the winemaking. She says she doesn't like this great mission as a red wine. Um, it's not the greatest grape in the world um, unless it's in a special site. It's often overproduced, um, uh, which is a bad thing for the sake of the taste of your wine. Um, and, you know, she prefers it in uh, like Blanc de Noir style whites and in rosés. Um, this one is, is made really simply. The Palafox, the first one you're, you're, you're drinking, aged entirely in stainless, um, uh, you know, minimal skin contact. And it's got this like bright briny savoriness that is uh, a kind of uh, a a real, you know, kind of um, uh, trademark of, of this varietal, that, you know, racy salinity um, is something that this grape always has. Even uh, when it's overproduced, it retains that, that acid-driven streak. Um, this is made in a pretty non-interventionist style, which is to say it's fermented with native yeast, um, and there are no additions to the wines. That is not the case throughout the most, uh, most of the Valle. Um, uh, the Valle accounts for about 90% of the wine made in Mexico, um, but the bulk of it is pretty adulterated. Um, what I find more exciting and what I featured for the sake of today's lesson were the natural leaning wineries um, in uh, Mexico. Um, and when I say natural, it's very much a loaded term, but the idea here is that you're making wine with a minimum amount of intervention. Uh, that takes on various, um, you know, kind of uh, degrees, you know, um, much like the French Revolution, you know, you, you can, um, you know, kind of be, uh, you know, uh, you know, very much uh, in favor of, you know, the uh, initial moves against you know, the, the Louis, you know, uh, 16th of the world, but, um, you know, then you have, you know, the Jacobins of the world. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the first wine we tasted, you know, a little more, you know, moderate in their, you know, natural wine, um, you know, kind of uh, revolutionary bent. Um, the second wine, much more on the Jacobin front. Um, uh, this is uh, one of the Tayes brothers. Um, uh, his, um, uh, this is Noel Tayes. Uh, his brother is a, a, a pretty famous chef um, in Mexico. Um, he uh, started uh, in, or kind of started his career in Mexico City. There's a thriving natural wine scene, um, natural wine bar scene in Mexico City. Um, and he uh, and his family just encamped to um, the Valle de Guadalupe. Um, they work with older vines. Bichi in the Sonoran dialect uh, uh, means naked. They have a lot of fun with the Lucha uh, um, uh, Libre figures uh, on their label. So they're playing up these Mexican cultural tropes in a really fun way. You can't see it on the front label, but on the back label, um, you get the back of your naked luchador 
um, you know, you would feel certainly um, uh, like you got cheated if you didn't get to see the luchadors, you know, culo, as it were. Um, uh, but, you know, you get both sides. Uh, sadly, you know, in uh, four ounce form, you guys don't get a sense of that. Um, but this is wine on the edge. Wine made in this international, um, you know, kind of natural style without sulfur. Um, uh, and, you know, that is to say that it's, you know, in its own way, kind of challenging. Um, uh, these guys are probably, I would say Beachy is the uh, best known, um, you know, brand um, as such, um, hip, you know, kind of uh, more internationally marketable brand to come out of the Valle de Guadalupe. Um, I had trouble with these wines. Um, I've liked them in previous vintages. Um, they are unsulfured and as such, uh, they um, experience a wine flaw called the mouse. Uh, um, some of you, I imagine, are getting a, a, a sense of that at home. I tried to encourage you to keep these cold. That is because mousiness is a microbiological fault that reveals itself as the wine warms. Um, and it presents as this um, perception of like, um, I get this like, uh, if you ever had hamsters as a kid, this like uh, rodent cage with cedar shavings thing. Um, uh, it is hugely unpleasant. Um, it reveals itself also as the wine comes up, raises in pH. Um, and as the wine oxygenates over time. I call these day one wines. Um, they can be good within the first um, 30. Uh, uh, yes, Mike, no coolos on the chat, uh, please. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, this is a, a day one wine, you know, within the first hours, it can be like drinkable, beguiling, enjoyable. But after that, you know, you go full like rodent um, on, on this wine. And, and, you know, I think it's a fun provocation, um, but, uh, the reason it tastes this way is because they're not using sulfur. Um, and uh, I don't think that sulfur is um, the evil force in wine that a lot of people have made it out to be. Uh, sulfur has been a part of winemaking since the Roman era. Um, uh, and uh, it is very possible to make uh, wine with minimal amounts of sulfur, even for people that are allergic to it, uh, that avoids the whole uh, hamster cage problem. Um, uh, do, any, do any of you have thoughts um, uh, about Mike's Kulo or the wines or... Uh, you know, the uh, kind of notion of making wine uh, in, a, in a border region um, at all. Uh, for our Mexican friends, did you want to add anything about, uh, you know, these two bottles, if you're familiar with them? Absolutely. Thank you, Bill. Uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation. Um, it, this is fun and, and, and exciting for me. To be honest, the Palafox I had not tried before. Um, and then just to be precise on geography, since we're talking about border regions, and, and I like the, the definition that you gave, Bill, and, you know, depending where we draw the border, you know, is, is Mexico or U.S. or what was uh, Mexico is now the U.S., the wine that we're going to taste from Napa, for example. Two out of the three wines that you selected, Bill, are not from the Guadalupe Valley. Uh, the Palafox is actually about 50 miles south of Ensenada. Oh, in, right. Yeah, in Valle de la Grulla. Uh, and as you said, Mission is a grape that was used for the most basic and unsophisticated wine production historically. I'm really surprised what the Palafox family and their winemaker did with this uh, rosé. I think it's, it's pretty sophisticated for, for, for such a basic varietal as, as is Mission. And then the Beachy is made closer to Tecate. So out of the wines that we're tasting today, it's the closest one to the border. Um, Napa is of course, you know, 500 miles for, from the border, depending on when we look at that border. Um, and then the only wine today from Mexico that's actually from Valle de Guadalupe oh, is the Carrodilla, yeah. which is a rock star. It's, it's, it's one of the best made wines in Mexico today. And um, just to tell you a little bit of the story of Beachy, because I, I know it well, Jair Telles is a very good friend of mine. I saw him, he used to work in, um, in the US and then he arrived at Valle de Guadalupe to start Laja, which was his first restaurant. It's still in operation. If you go to the Valley, you must go to Laja. Um, and I can give you guys other recommendations. Enrique and Vaughn have my contact information. I love uh, helping people out when they visit uh, Valle de Guadalupe and Ensenada. So Jair started Laja in Valle de Guadalupe first, then moved to Mexico City. We actually moved here more or less at the same time, but I, I saw the birth of Laja in Valle de Guadalupe, which 
kind of raise the level of, of the gastronomical uh, proposal there. He started Beachy as an experiment. At the beginning, it was terrible. Um, I don't know how that terrible compares to what you're drinking now, because I, I didn't even bother to try to get one to, tonight, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. It got, it went up and, and went really, really well. Actually, the, the label is designed by Jair's father-in-law. Oh, cool. Who's an artist. Uh, I, I would have never selected that label, but I guess it has to do with the nature of, you know, kind of fuck it, uh, kind of um, well, attitude. It's funny, there's this trope in uh, the natural wine world that, you know, if you have a problematic wine, you slap a cool label on it and, you know, that, that solves the problem. Um, I've, yeah. had, I've been drinking their wines for a while too, and, and they showed up when, um, uh, the, uh, when Noma invaded Cancun, they, they looked for a lot of uh, local Mexican wines to serve as a part of that um, uh, event. Rene Redzepi and his sommelier crew did, and uh, they featured quite a few of the Beachy wines um, because you know, Noma is, is very much um, uh, about you know, kind of waving a flag for the natural wine movement. It's funny yeah. for me, I, I've enjoyed their wines more in previous vintages. So I've had the, the one from Rosa de Peru, which is, you know, a different varietal. And, and that's been more stable than this bottling. This comes and from- And I'll tell you vines. why. Well, this comes from younger, younger vines in Tecate, yeah. And also what happened is, and, and you're right, I was able to go to Noma in, in Tulum and I was really surprised to see the Vichy on the wine list. It's one of the best experiences I've ever had in my life. Uh, not just gastronomically speaking, but it was really, really a well-rounded project. And the Vichy at that point made sense. It somehow paired well with the food. You know, it was at the height of its, you know, quality levels, uh, if, if we may call it that. Then it kind of uh, was unpredictable. And then Jair, who's, who's a very, who's, a, who's passionate about natural wines and has become kind of an ambassador for, for natural wines in Mexico, left Beachy. He has nothing to do with Beachy anymore. Um, I guess his brother is in charge now and is kind of uh, improvising along the way. But I've literally had people tell me that they try it and then it goes down the drain. They don't even want yeah, it. I, I, yeah, it feels, it feels a little um, less, you know, it has a lot of natural wines are thrilling, even if they're not delicious, you know, conventionally delicious. And, you know, for me, the, the first few vintages I had of the Rosa del Peru in particular, which comes from like centenarian vines. Um, uh, and Rosa del Peru is another varietal like um, uh, Pais that was one of the first brought over to uh, the New World by Spanish missionaries. And it should be said, I have a really like soft spot for Pais. Um, uh, it, it shows up a lot in Chilean wines in this, in this wine called Pipeño that's really amazing um, and kind of being rediscovered as well as, as part of kind of like this broader Latin American uh, natural wine movement. And it is capable of more, but typically it, it went into like communion wine. It was like, you know, plunk. Um, uh, I wanted to share the, a broader map of Mexico. Uh, it's funny too, people, um, the Valle de Guadalupe is, is a very small region. Um, you know, we talked about the, the wines being from actually, actually outside the region. It should be said too, that a lot of the wineries that are representing themselves as making wine in Valle de Guadalupe are actually taking grapes from other places in Mexico. So that's something you see across the wine world. You know, in Italy, it was already, it was always Sicily that, you know, actually accounted for the bulk of a lot of Northern Italian wine. In, in uh, France, it was always, you know, wine from Languedoc. So, you know, uh, Valle de Guadalupe is useful. You know, it turns out 90% of Mexican wine, but you know, 90% of Mexican wine is made there, not necessarily comes from there. And it's become a very useful marketing vehicle because it's very beautiful. Um, and, you know, it's become the center of kind of international tourism for both sides of the border, for people coming from Mexico City and other parts of Mexico, and then uh, for gringos coming down from, um, you know, San Diego and, and, and other, other environments. But, you know, it's certainly not the only place uh, that makes wine in Mexico, um, uh, but it is, it is surely the most famous. These are some of the other Mexican winemaking, you know, regions of note. Um, it should be said the reason the 30th parallel is on there is because um, there's this kind of classic trope in uh, the wine world that um, the grape Vitis vinifera that goes into fine wine uh, grows best between 30 and 50 degrees uh, north and south latitude. Um, that's changing because, you know, the world is warming and there are a lot of other factors that, um, you know, kind of uh, have an impact on that. And then, you know, I think the, the other thing that's worth mentioning is that, um, you know, uh, the Valle is in, the, in a desert um, and uh, water 
issues are very much real there, uh, just like they are in parts of, you know, most of California and certainly in Napa. Um, so, you know, the, the, the increase in tourism has been really good for the local economy, but, um, you know, it's a region that can only sustain so much. Uh, do you wanna, let's move on to the, um, I think uh, uh, Corriera, you seem um, very excited about that wine. I, I love this wine. I'm gonna pull up, uh, uh, do you wanna talk about this one? Uh, I'll pull up a picture of the estate. Um, and, and it's kind of funny because this is uh, um, one of the first real proponents of biodynamic viticulture in uh, Mexico, which is other than our Slovenian Italian um, dip another kind of through line for the sake of, um, you know, wines from the former Austro-Hungarian Empire and, and uh, wines from along the U.S.-Mexico border. But um, uh, I'm going to pull up an image of uh, La Finca uh, here. Um, and uh, this is a really, a really stunning wine. Um, and you're dealing with uh, uh, one of the, you know, America's foremost winemakers in uh, Gustavo Gonzalez, um, who actually is UC Davis trained. So you know, we're going to talk about the, the next two wines and kind of um, deal more with the fluidity uh, of the border. So, you know, there wouldn't be um, American wine without Mexican labor. I think people don't, you know, say that a lot, but it ne really needs to be uh, understood. Um, and, you know, as such, um, it, you know, is, is, is very fitting uh, that Mexico is, is you know, really uh, within the last decade or two beginning to kind of claim its own um, you know, kind of uh, place on the international uh, wine stage. But uh, Finca La Cordillera is one of the first biodynamic um, uh, certified states in uh, Mexico. This is their Syrah, which comes from 100%. Um, I think this is all a state grown fruit, is it not? Anyway, I believe it's a state grown fruit. Yes, but. yes, it is. And um, I'm actually surprised that you got it up in, in DC because there's only 3000 bottles of this wine made each year. Um, and, you know, they're doing a fantastic job. Another thing to note is Carrodilla will be 10 years old this year. I mean, it's a very young winery doing very interesting things. And, you know, the Mexican wine industry in terms of quality winemaking, it's, it's also still really young. Uh, the first winery that started making decent wines uh, in Mexico was Monte Chanique in the middle of the 80s. And then the, the, the boom of Ensenada and Valle de Guadalupe, which is by far the most important, you know, um, Bill mentioned that 90% of the wines produced in Mexico come from Baja California. And after Monte Chanique, Hugo da Costa started uh, Casa de Piedra, which is still one of the best wine produced in, in, in Mexico. But in the past 20 years, uh, there's been an amazing growth of, of wineries and, and production in, in Baja and Carrodilla is definitely one of the most interesting. They managed to uh, somehow, I still haven't figured it out how they managed to not get the minerality and the, the saltness of the lack of water in the earth affect their wines so much as, as other labels that, that, that you may find uh, in Mexico. So I think this, this Carrodilla Sirá was a great, great choice. I opened it 30 minutes before we began and it's still, you know, it's, it's strong. And the fact that they do varietals 100%, they have four labels that are 100% varietals. They do an amazing job. Yeah, and I, I you know, it's, it's funny, the, a lot of, I find a lot of the cuisine in, um, you know, in Baja has this like, almost like a Mexican Mediterranean quality to it and, and this, this wine has almost like a Southern Mediterranean inflection. Um, you know, Syrah is, is a grape that figures prominently in, um, you know, a, a lot of Mediterranean regions in the old world. And it's a grape that does well in warmer environments. Um, uh, but I, I love their wines because they reflect kind of like the, you know, kind of sun-kissed fruit of, you know, a warmer place, but they're very elegant um, as well, which is, which is really hard to pull off. And um, they're incredibly sophisticated. Um, I love, so the, the Syrah is, is banging. My, my first love was uh, they make the um, uh, uh, Canto de Luna, um, which again has a, also has like a beautiful label. So the, um, you know, which doesn't go without saying, but their, their mascot is an Argentine, um, basically like a, a, a virgin of the, of the vineyard. Um, uh, but they're playing with a lot of like these kind of mystical tropes for the sake of biodynamic agriculture. 
Um, Biodynamic is this system uh, invented by um, an Austrian philosopher named Rudolf Steiner. Um, and uh, it kind of grew out of a series of lectures that he gave in the 20s. Um, uh, and, and Rudolf Steiner is the man behind the Waldorf schools. Um, he's a really interesting cat, but uh, the idea here is that the, he envisioned the farm as a self-sustaining entity. So it's just, uh, above and beyond, a step above and beyond um, uh, just organic. Um, and it envisions you know, the, the, um, uh, the people, um, the animals on the farm contributing equally to uh, the welfare of the plants as everything else. And um, it has been increasingly embraced by quality conscious vineyards around the world um, because it engages this level of mindfulness, um, uh, you know, when working with the vines, that's really not possible um, otherwise. Uh, it, is been, it has been derided as, as pseudoscience, um, uh, uh, but that said, you know, some of the greatest wines um, in the world um, are, are made um, by people uh, implementing biodynamic principles. So it is a place where I think, you know, at the very least, um, yes, the inspiration is you know, fairly scientific, but um, you know, certainly the results can't be argued with. And to have, um, you know, this estate um, making wines of this caliber in, um, you know, the Valle, I think speaks to, you know, the, um, you know, how, how far the wines have come. I think it also speaks to, you know, the way in the wine world that a lot of these ideas are transferable and like borderless. So, you know, you have someone like uh, Gustavo Gonzalez that's studying at UC Davis, which is essentially the Harvard of, you know, um, American wine schools, um, along with Cornell, I guess. And then, and then you know, you have, uh, you know, people at the, the consulting, uh, you know, uh, viticulturalist at uh, uh, Pala Fox that, you know, are studying in Bordeaux. So um, there is this kind of, uh, the wine world is very fluid that way and very fun that way. And when you are initially making your way up in the wine world, it's very common for people to globe trot and work a harvest in, you know, Chile and then work a harvest in the Northern hemisphere and then work a harvest in Australia and then work a harvest in the, and, and because, you know, harvest is the most significant time in the calendar. So, you know, you get this, um, you know, spread of ideas um, and, and that is new even in the old world. You know, that's not something that people did in France, you know, in Italy and Spain and Germany um, until this last generation. And um, I think, you know, a lot of people um, are benefiting from that. And then you see this like internationalization of ideas in wine culture. And, um, you know, I've not been to Mexico City Saturday, but I think you see that for the sake of, of the natural wine movement uh, in Mexico City. Um, what is the wine drinking culture uh, like in, in Mexico? It's growing. It's amazing. In the past 20 years, it's grown a lot. Um, I, I wrote a piece when I was living in Ensenada about, uh, Mex it, it was called Mexican wine country with a question mark, si senor, you know, it was, n I, I arrived in Ensenada in 98 for Vendimia and I did not know we were making these wines. Um, and so Vendimia is the, the, like the annual, like harvest, kind of like a harvest. Harvest, huh? yeah. harvest festival, yeah. correct. Um, and you know, those festivals were, were small, they were local. We had, you know, people come from other places but it was still like a very, I don't know, small town kind of uh, celebration. And now it's, it's crazy. Like if, if you go, if you try to go to Vendimia uh, in Ensenada, uh, hotels are crazy expensive. Uh, there's no room. It's actually not as fun anymore now. To uh, it's funny because my, my friend said the same thing. He, uh, he said, you know, he went down when he was first, you know, uh, teaching uh, at uh, UCSD. And, you know, he said it was amazing. You know, it was, it was still kind of, more rural and he felt like he'd stumbled upon this like winemaking Eden and you know he's gone back to some of the same wineries and he just sees like a bunch of people that look like him <laughs> it's just like, exactly like, they lose Hugo, Hugo, Acosta, Hugo Acosta has a good phrase he says that if there are bad roads that brings good tourism yeah yeah totally good roads bring bad tourism so we're getting bad tourism now. I know I know a lot of um uh, I've heard that before I know a lot of uh winery owners who intentionally do not pave their um their driveways because of that um you know uh who's your friend at ucsd by the way uh, uh michael latiri okay uh he he doesn't, he doesn't teach there anymore he kind of he works for a separate think tank but uh um he yeah he, he goes down a lot he actually he got really he did a fulbright in mexico city um he got really into the um uh the mezcal scene uh in oaxaca um yeah which, that's that's a dangerous scene to uh, it's, am it's amazing though it's really <laughs> interesting but yeah it is, it is a dangerous scene um, Enrique, and I asked because Enrique and I have a, another very good friend who actually specializes.
specializes on the US-Mexico border, it would be uh, fun to invite him to one of these gatherings at some point. His name is Teddy Cruz, and the way he understands the US-Mexico border is amazing. Yeah, so um, 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 Utiri is the Senior Fellow for Human Rights um, uh, at uh, the US-Mexico Studies um, uh, Institute at, uh, at UCSD. Um, he does a lot of work with uh, um, like drug violence and stuff like that in, in, in you know, throughout Mexico um, and disappearances, but um, he's very interested in the drinking culture throughout the country, like on the side uh, for, he knows more. He, I didn't realize this, but apparently Tijuana has a really big like craft beer scene um, that he's like really plugged into. Um, and, and Ensenada as well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, I wanted to pull up a picture of, uh, the winemakers for uh, a final bottle from the kind of like representative of this, of this US uh, Mexico border. And there's this idea in border studies, especially when it comes to um, the US Mexico border that, you know, we are the border. Um, and uh, I think that's really significant when we think about how wine comes to the table. So um, wineries, you know, winemakers talk a lot about, you know, environmental sustainability and things like biodynamic and or organics. Um, but you don't hear them talk about, you know, the people that are, um, you know, pruning and harvesting and, you know, doing all the manual labor that is required to bring these kinds of wines um, to the glass. And that's hugely significant because in a place like California, uh, roughly 90% of the, agri the agricultural workforce is, is Mexican. Um, uh, it's, it's actually under stress now for a variety of reasons. Uh, Mexican economy has gotten better. Uh, border enforcement has gotten a lot stronger. Um, uh, but I think the, the cool thing is you're starting to see second and third generation um, uh, Mexican Americans um, uh, starting to uh, own um, the fruits of their own labor and starting to make wines. And uh, this comes from one of the most famous um, uh, such uh, estates. Um, uh, this is the, the Seha family. Um, and uh, you see, oh, I forgot names here, um, but uh, the daughter of the uh, proprietor there. Um, and uh, her father came over uh, initially um, in uh, the 60s. Um, and uh, he says uh, his first week in Mexico, uh, or first week in America, rather, uh, he spent the first hour of each day uh, eating grapes before he got around to picking them, which is significant because uh, he was picking Merlot in 1967 at Tocalan. Tocalan is arguably the most famous uh, vineyard in Napa Valley. Um, he said it took him like he initially applied for a green card in Mexico. It took him six weeks to get his green card and he was in the United States. Um, that experience has changed a lot um, uh, since then. Uh, but uh, over time, uh, the Seha family, um, uh, his daughter um, uh, and uh, siblings um, were able to save and purchase land uh, beginning with six hectares in 1983. Um, and uh, they now own 150, which is pretty, pretty remarkable. Um, they own 150 throughout um, uh, Napa and Sonoma, um, the wine we're tasting here is kind of like their workaday field blend. It's mostly Syrah. I thought it'd be fun to try two Syrahs against each other, uh, but there's, um, oh, sorry, it's, it's mostly Pinot rather. Um, uh, I apologize. Uh, there is Syrah in the mix though. Um, this is kind of Pinot that tastes like Syrah, honestly, um, because it's from a warmer climate, but 70% um, uh, Pinot, 20% Syrah and 10% Merlot. Um, they're working with um, American and, and French oak. This is kind of less representative of, um, you know, kind of a more non-intervention style and more representative of a typical kind of modern bombastic California style of wine. Um, Carneros is cool because it's at the southern end of Napa and Sonoma. It straddles the southern end of both. It actually, um, if we're talking borders, it's a fascinating region uh, because it bridges those two borders. Um, uh, you know, Americans don't place much faith on their designation of origin system, but uh, Carneros is unique that way. Um, and it uh, sees this really cooling influence um, from um, the bay. Um, uh, basically, the closer you are to water in California, the cooler it is. Um, and, you know, north-south doesn't matter as much as proximity to the bay ocean. Um, so you get a cooling influence here for the sake of the wine, which is still big. Um, you know, you're, you're tipping the scales at 14% alcohol and change, but, you know, very drinkable. Um, uh, and this is just their workaday entry. You know, I mean, honestly, I don't, I don't find, this is one of those wines that, you know, for me is more interesting because of the people making it uh, than it is, you know, uh, on the face of it for, for the wine. Um, you know, but I think in this industry, it is really important to have people that don't look like me making wine. Um, and uh, in, the, in the kind of, um, within the economic structure of winemaking, it's really important to have people that work the land um, actually ultimately, you know, 
own the means of their own production because it's very hard. It's very expensive uh, business to be in. Uh, most winemakers get their start by purchasing fruit um, and making wine on the lark as opposed to uh, purchasing land. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, there's, there's a reason why, you know, the bulk of, you know, uh, wine owners, um, you know, look like I do, as opposed to, you know, reflecting, you know, the full tapestry of the people that, you know, have contributed to making the wine industry what it is, um, you know, if, you know, the uh, kind of ownership structure reflected the labor force, um, there would be a lot more Spanish brand names, <laughs> Hispanic brand names in, in, in the wine world. And, you know, I, I do find it, you know, if you do find yourself ever visiting a winery, you know, I, I would encourage you to just think about that, you know, think about who is harvesting, think about, you know, there are these disparities of wealth in these places like Napa, where, you know, um, the folks that ultimately are allowing limousines to pull up and drink wine, you know, they're sleeping in tents, you know, they're, you know, crowding a dozen people to, you know, a small apartment, three hour drive away, and, you know, working for six months that way, like that is the reality. Um, uh, and, you know, they're doing that in hopes of a better life for people at home. Um, you know, typically that workforce um, is not from um, Baja. You know, typically that workforce is from much further south within, Me within Mexico, um, Michoacan, Oaxaca, Chiapas. You know, the bulk of that workforce is, is from, you know, that part of the country. Um, uh, you know, and that goes for most agricultural labor, but that particularly goes for the wine world. For me, the fascinating kind of redeeming thing about um, wine work is it's a, a very highly specialized form of agricultural work. Um, so particularly with the um, H2A program, you will get, um, and, and, and you know, I know a lot of wineries that work with the same you know, um, crew year in and year out, and it can become less exploitative. You know, if you're working with the same people year in and year out, and you know, they um, you know, prefer to spend six months here and then six months you know, in Mexico at home, um, you know, then you know, that's, that's viable. You know, that is a more humane um, economic uh, structure. Um, but, you know, uh, there is, you know, there are still um, a lot of gaps um, for the, you know, the sake of the welfare of uh, this largely, you know, kind of Mexican migrant labor force, um, you know, working in the wine industry on this side of the border. Um, you know, that said, it's, it's really cool for me, too. I mean, I, I have some of my fondest memories, um, you know, in on the winery, you know, harvesting, working harvest at places have been, you know, listening, like harvesting El, like elbow to elbow with, you know, a bunch, a bunch of Mexican migrant laborers just singing ranchero songs, you know, like full belt, like that's the music of harvest. And then when you eat, you know, they're making tacos, you know, they're not like, like that is like, it's like paria, like that's the, you know, that is the cuisine. And you get all these really strange bedfellows, uh, you, know, in, you know, disparate wine communities in Napa, Sonoma and places as far flung as the Finger Lakes, you know, you get you know, the local school suddenly has an influx of, you know, Spanish speaking students. So, you know, it speaks to the way in which, you know, the border comes to us um, in these kind of um, isolated you know, pockets that depend on this, this workforce. Um, we're going to switch gears here and consider, um, you know. So Bill, uh, Bill before, yeah. before, before you go on, can, you know, so you mentioned with, with Mexico or with the, with the belt or the band, the latitudinal band, where you start seeing sort of the, the assumption of, Particularly for for wines that are sort of in in a border region like Mexico, like, you know, one of the major issues that's borderless is climate change. How how have or how would how are wineries that are outside of that band now not just make, considering or thinking about the implications of climate change? I, I feel like you know, water is a, honestly I feel like water is a bigger issue in Mexico than um, uh, than temperature. They, yeah, um, I mean. The water is ostensibly governed and owned by the state in Mexico, but and you have to solicit the government's permission to dig a well, but that's not, I don't know how well enforced that is. And then on top of that, there's just not a lot of regulation around development, um, you know, which is an issue in the states too, um, certainly, and an issue throughout the West. Um, but I see that as being a bigger issue. Um, in wine making regions, things that people do, typically they go up, so altitude, is a good substitute for latitude. Um, uh, and that's why regions like, well, south of the 30th parallel in Mexico can make um, wine. There's actually a lot of sparkling wine um, throughout you know, some of those regions further south of um, Valle, de, Valle de Guadalupe. Um, uh, I don't know, Carlos, can you speak to that question better? Even, even in Valle de Guadalupe, Hugo da Costa at Casa de Piedra is making an amazing sparkling wine. 
uh, that's really inexpensive and it's super high quality. As of, uh, you know, as for the question of climate change, uh, it must be affecting. I don't know how, uh, but yeah, the issue of water is like the main concern today. Um, I think it may affect other wine regions because being, being, being where Ensenada is and the Guadalupe Valley and the other valleys that produce grapes around uh, Valle de Guadalupe, because Valle de Guadalupe is the center of, you know, like tourism and, and, and production, but there's uh, vineyards uh, north towards Tecate and south uh, towards Ojos Negros. Um, but I wouldn't know. I don't have an answer for the climate change question. I'll get back to you on that one. Uh, no, thank you, Carlos. And, and Franklin just just, um, just pointed out that, you know, obviously the, the, to Bill's point about the water being a major issue, the, the, the question about, you know, even the transboundary water exchanges between, between the U.S. and Mexico has always been sort of a big political question. Well, speaking about the borders, I worked on a project that had to do with um, a river restoration in Tecate at, at some point in my life. And the, the conclusion there was, um, why are borders not designed with, the, I don't know what the term is in English, but the watersheds, I guess, of the yeah. rivers. So yeah. if the, instead of, 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 of this being, you know, a horizontal line, like the one we have between San Diego and Tijuana, I mean, if, if, if you're thinking about resources and water, et cetera, that should be like at the top of the mountains so that water flows yeah. to one country and to the other. I mean, if, if we agree that borders make sense, which is another issue, but if they do, then, I mean, there's a terrible uh, problem, for example, in Tijuana, uh, throwing like wastewater to the Tijuana River and it ends up in San Diego. So San Diego is suffering the consequences of not having uh, of not dealing with, with wastewater issues in Tijuana. So it's a whole deal, but just the thought or the concept of having borders have to do more with geography and topography than with just some political historical decision is, is, is something I thought was, was very interesting to take into account. Is there one, so what would the, you know, one takeaway for, I think, there's still a novelty factor with, with Mexican wine for uh, a lot of people on this side of the border. What would be the one thing that you would want people to, to know about it other than that it doesn't suck? Um, that it's young. We, yeah. we need to give it some time to find its own identity, uh, to evolve, to mature. Um, it's, a, it's a really fun time now. You know, it's like, um, I mean, I don't want to compare it to a toddler, but maybe to, you know, it's just a very young industry and there's lots of things happening all over the place. Uh, there's people that are not taking it very seriously. There's others who are, like Carrodilla, for example, and Pal Palafox, evidently. Um, it's really interesting. My, my suggestion is that the next meeting that we have is there. You know, once we're <laughs> able to fly, you can all fly to San Diego. We'll get a nice vehicle, drive across the border, and we can spend a fun weekend in Valle de Guadalupe. That, that's, that's what I would suggest. Oh, that sounds brilliant. Um, excellent. So we're gonna we're gonna switch gears here and consider a, a very different um, corner of the the old world um, with uh, you know kind of equally fascinating um, you know history vis-a-vis -vis, uh, its wines and um, this is uh, Slovenia um, uh, and uh, Italy and I'm gonna pull up uh, you know yet another map. Um, I promised a lot of maps and I aim to aim to please. Um, Give me one moment here. Um, so uh, this uh, region of the old world kind of exists at a crossroads of trade routes. So, you know, coming up from the bottom of the boot, coming up from, you know, Greece through the Balkans, um, you know, you're really at the axis of this, you know, kind of uh, north, south, east, west uh, set of, of trade routes. And, um, you know, since antiquity, um, you know, this kind of littoral region of Italy and, and Slovenia um, has been a natural uh, border um, between, um, you know, various empires uh, and, and states. Um, and, you know, what I find fascinating is that you, in a border zone, you get this, you know, um, mixing of people, you know, of different ethnicities, um, you know, linguistic backgrounds, um, et cetera. And, and here um, you had this kind of 
uh, mixing of, uh, you know, uh, Latin speaking peoples, Germanic speaking peoples, and, and Slavic um, uh, speaking uh, peoples. Um, and historically, that kind of works. Um, you know, it, it works, but it only really works, uh, you know, in the context of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and, and then more broadly, you have kind of a similar situation in, in the Ottoman Empire, um, where you have a, a weak central government. Um, so, you know, you have a lot of diverse peoples that can, you know, coexist, um, you know, within, you know, these uh, diverse, you know, centers of population um, in a very fluid state without clearly defined borders. Um, that becomes a problem, you know, once the whole nation state program really takes off, once Germany and Italy unify, you know, once these, you know, kind of newly formed, um, you know, kind of political entities with the stronger national um, kind of identity, uh, you know, begin to flex their muscles uh, coming into, um, you know, initially the Balkan, Balkan Wars, uh, but, you know, the two Balkan Wars, but really in, into uh, World War I is where it, it, it crashes um, uh, for the sake of Italy and Slovenia. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of people spend time for the sake of World War I, you know, talking about, you know, million dead, uh, you know, in another wine region, Champagne, um, along the Marne, uh, but uh, equally deadly, uh, this equally, you know, valuable wine region. I mean, all this wine and, you know, tragedy, um, uh, but uh, basically defined along uh, this Eastern front um, in World War uh, I, uh, defined by a river that the Italians call the uh, Isonso and that the Slovenians call the Socha. Um, and my Slovene is even worse than my Spanish, so I apologize for any, you know, Slovenians out there. Um, uh, but uh, the Italians are great opportunists in um, uh, World War I originally, or, or ostensibly they're part of the Triple Alliance, so they pledged their fate um, to uh, Germany um, and Austria-Hungary, but they hedge their bets and ultimately uh, take a heel turn um, and do the, you know, backroom, they basically cut a backroom deal with the Allies to gain access to um, the Austro-Hungarian littoral which is to say, um, make um, historically Slovenian speaking lands Italian. That's like the whole project. Um, and uh, there's a huge, um, you know, militarization of this front, um, very cold, miserable fighting, over a million and a half people die over the course of 12 major battles. Um, fascinatingly enough, the Italians ultimately lose um, uh, uh, the 11th and Seminole battle um, but of course they win the war, so they gain a huge chunk of uh, Slovenian territory. Um, uh, sadly, um, uh, in the interwar period, um, they, uh, and actually Slovenia in that time, uh, you know, essentially ceases to exist and, and loses access to the sea. It's a big, you know, you lose that access to the sea, that is a big, you know, national problem. Uh, but uh, uh, fascism uh, doesn't work out as well for the Italians under Mussolini. Uh, they are big losers of World War II, um, which cuts a chunk out of Italy uh, and uh, Yugoslavia gains. But uh, the Yugoslav system, kind of more of a, a Serbian project than a Slovenian project. So the Slovenians are, are caught in the, in the mix here. Um, you know, for the sake of wine, it's really fascinating because everybody's drinking the same juice. Um, the same grapes are prevalent across borders. And we're going to try a pair of wines um, that are essentially the same versions of different things across the border. But through the mere accident of history, these wines are made very differently in uh, the Cold War era. Now, you know, Yugoslavia, not part of the Warsaw Pact, but still very much kind of behind the softer Iron Curtain. Um, say what you want about the merits of state-sponsored socialism. Very much a quantity over quality paradigm for the sake of the wines. Not good for wine quality at all. Um, it's been remarkable that Slovenia has recovered as quickly as it has after um, the fall of, um, oh, <laughs> of, uh, of communism. Um, it has rebounded faster than any of the other former Balkan states. Um, you know, it, it's kept, um, you know, the ongoing, uh, you know, kind of civil strikes there at, at arm's length. And the wine industry in uh, these adjoining regions has uh, rebounded uh, remarkably. We're dealing with two adjoining regions, Colio and Birda. Um, they're literally right across the border from each other. I'm gonna pull up that map again. Um, they are also, um, it should be said, uh, cartoonishly beautiful. I feel like that's a thing with these border zones is, you know, just like achingly beautiful landscapes and 
tragedy. Um, it's just like more poetic that way. Um, but um, this is a, sh a shot essentially, I think this is either it's either from one side of the border to the other, you know, you would never know. And then there aren't, this is like the opposite of, um, you know, the American wall scenario. It is not hugely militarized, um, uh, you know, culturally very fluid. Um, it's said historically that the Italians lived in the cities and the Slovenes lived in the countryside. Um, you know, there's some truth to that. There's not some truth to that. In Trieste, um, there's still talk of actually seceding from Italy because they feel, you know, uh, more culturally Slavic than they do Italian, which is really fascinating. Um, people on both sides of the border speak uh, Italian and Slovene at, you know, the least. There's a distinct Friulian dialect of Italian that people very often will speak. Um, but for the sake of the wine, what I find fascinating is during the interwar period, wine sucked um, in uh, Yugoslavia. Um, everything was nationalized. Um, all You could make wine yourself, which kind of redeemed things. Um, and, and on a decently large scale, you could make wine yourself. Um, and people continue to in Slovenia. But Italy is a, is a huge winner. This is, Friuli is one of the first regions in Italy to, to modernize its winemaking. Uh, if you're drinking Pinot Grigio at home, um, you're drinking Friuli and Pinot Grigio and, and Northern Italians have everything to do. They're, they're laughing all the way to the bank, um, you know, for the sake of the Santa Margaritas of the world. Uh, what's remarkable to me is in a, a relatively short period, you know, these two sides have, you know, relatively equalized. And so, um, you know, and, and, you know, the, the Slovenes have, you know, kind of caught up um, and, and influenced the Italians for the sake of re-embracing more of these non-interventionist styles that already existed in the region, but they're kind of reclaiming as their own, which I, I find really fascinating and kind of touches on, you know, um, you know, kind of the, the conversation we were having vis-a-vis, -vis, um, uh, you know, the, the, the beachy Palafox uh, wines that we tasted earlier. Uh, this is a pair of Pinot Grigios um, on the Italian side. So, so this grape is, is Pinot Gris um, originally. Um, it's important to, to understand that Pinot Gris is a, a family of grapes. Um, if you look at um, a Pinot uh, Grigio on the vine, um, it looks uh, uh, more ruddy colored uh, than it does, um, you know, hard and fast white. Um, uh, you know, it, it has this kind of softer pink hue to it. Um, yeah. If you get it any time on the skins, then the wine reflects that. And traditionally in this region, there's a long history of making what hipster insufferable psalms call orange wine or amber wine. Um, uh, for those uninitiated, uh, orange wine is um, wine made from white grapes, but the, the white juice is left on the white grape skins. So a wine that typically doesn't pick up any color picks up color from the grape skins. And there's a long tradition of making wine that way from white grapes on both sides of the Birda Colio coin here. Um, Bill, Bill, sorry to interrupt, but I don't know if that's the way they made the Rosé at Palafox. No, no. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, no, I was just speaking to more broadly, like a non-interventionist spiel, as opposed to like uh, uh, orange wine. That's just a direct press rosé, as I understand it, in from the Palaflux. Got it. Yeah, yeah. Bill, can you can you confirm? Just sorry, can you say again which wines were on? I think there's some confusion. I apologize. Yeah. So uh, we're drinking um, uh, two uh, Pinot Grigio on the Italian side uh, from Vinica um, uh, Evinica. Um, the Vinica family, um, uh, they started the winery in the 30s. Um, and then um, we were drinking the, uh, the uh, Movia uh, uh, Civi Pinot, um, Civi being, you know, uh, gray in Slovene. Um, and so this is the uh, Pinot Grigio from both sides of the uh, Italian-Slovenian border. And thank you, thank you for keeping me honest there, Jason. I, I, I get ahead of myself. Uh, for the sake of explaining these things, but we've got um, the tables on the bottle, so we're, I think everyone's just trying to figure out which. Oh is. yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, so yeah, so this is uh, Venica Pinot Grigio um, and Movia Civi Pinot, um, and what's cool is that you're getting like uh, various shades of orange for the sake of these wines. So if you leave the juice on the skins for varying amounts of time, you get varying degrees of color. So. For the sake of um, Vinica and Vinica, it kind of reflects more of the Friulian tradition of a few hours on the skins. And they say in Italian, they call this Ramato. Everything sounds better in Italian, but Ramato means Auburn. So like Ramato. Um, and, and it reflects the fact that you get this Auburn, beautiful Auburn color when you give Pinot Grigio a few hours on the skins. And this, this doesn't taste like a traditional orange wine. A lot of orange wines taste cider-like. This is pretty, it's fleshy. It's got this like lovely orchard fruit quality to it. It's not natty. It doesn't taste like 
Levici that we, we tried earlier. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't taste like luchador culo, you know, it, it, it's like, you know, delicious. Um, uh, and then um, uh, the Movia is made uh, by a really, you know, fun character. I'll pull up a picture of him just because he's, uh, he's a fascinating dude. Um, uh, and he's very much like a, uh, um, a, he has a wine bar in um, the Slovene capital. He's a huge force in, in the local, on the local wine scene. Um, this is Alex Kuschanczyk, um, and he is a huge advocate of biodynamic uh, winemaking. He's got, a, he's got a good look. I feel like he just has a good look. Um, uh, uh, but uh, Alex, a huge advocate of biodynamic winemaking. Um, his Ambra, uh, which is the darker of the two Pinot Grigios that you have there, um, spends significantly longer on the skin. So that one spends 10 days on the skin. So it's the difference of the same grape, Pinot Grigio, grown on both sides of the Italian-Slovenian border. On the Italian side, it spends four to eight hours on the skins. On the Slovenian side, it spends 10, 10 hours on the skins. And I think it's fun to get a sense of, you know, the evolution there um, and to trace, um, you know, uh, the flavor profile, the varietal between, you know, those two wines with that one variable manipulated. And to get a sense of how on both sides of the border, they're working in the same milieu, um, you know, uh, they endured very different experiences historically, uh, uh, you know, emotionally, politically in the 20th century, but everything converged. It all came back. Um, and, you know, it speaks to the ways that, you know, we can define borders, but they don't always define us. You know, sometimes these larger cultural forces supersede, you know, these political, you know, vagaries that we throw in the mix, which is hugely fascinating. In this region, it took them until 1953 to fucking define the border. They were still fighting World War II through 1953 on the Italian-Slovenian border. It's crazy. It's like madness. Um, uh, but at any rate, um, this, it should be said also, it's like one of my favorite styles of wine. Um, they're cerebral. You know, it's not like a, you're not going to pound this on a patio. Maybe the Vinica. Like, but you know they're they're a little wonkier. Um, I think they're delicious with the seven layer dip. Um, but you know they're they're nerdy wines. But I think they're really dynamic um, and, and interesting. Uh, any thoughts? Uh, anyone want to weigh in? I sorry. I had Ted Cruz or Fled Fled Cruz. Um, oh, Jason, I confirmed which wines. Um, no Kula. Uh, glad to hear it. Uh, any thoughts on uh, these two offerings? Pluses or minuses for Italy versus Slovenia? Slovenia all the way. So much better. Slovenia. We have a, uh, what do you like about the, um, the Slovenian? I don't know. It just tastes better. <laughs> I don't better. know. Great. Tasty. Tasty. I'm not actually a fan of white wine. I, I oh, like cool. red wine, but I, I like this one. Awesome. So that this is very much like a white wine for red wine drinkers. Um, that's well, kind of the, that's the whole program. That's the whole yeah. program. Um, I passed the uh, test. And, and, and that works texturally because the thing that red wine has that it derives from its contact with skin tannins. Um, and, and, you know, white wine typically doesn't have that grip. Um, and this, this definitely does. Um, uh, you know, and, and texturally, I, I find it really interesting. I think like as you drink more, um, you know, hopefully if you don't descend into, you know, bottle area excess, you know, you start to get, you know, interested in the texture of wines as much as, you know, definable uh, tasting, tasting notes. Uh, uh, Carlos, I feel like- So Bill, like so Bill, you, so Bill do, yeah. they, do, they, do they open up different, differently because of the differences in the tannins or, or not? They, they, I, I find they evolve differently. So tannins, okay. this, is, this is kind of wonky and scientific, but tannins uh, are um, these like long chain, pol long, long chain polymers. So there's these like long molecules that get longer and longer as a wine ages. But counterintuitively, they actually get so long that they drop out. So we lose our, if they get sufficiently long, we lose our ability to kind of perceive them. So um, they get longer, but they soften for us as they age. So these wines will age differently, um, dramatically so. Um, but um, I, I don't, I, whether they open up differently, I, I think they will, but that has more to do with the quality of fruit and the acidity, I think, than the tannins, um, uh, you know, initially in the glass. Um, Fair to say that Vanica is more acidic. Is that is that a good is that a? Um, it's that's I think that's fair to say. I think I think uh, a lot of that has to do with winemaking style. Um, I think they harvested a little earlier and they were after something that was kind of like brighter and crunchier. Whereas Alish, like knowing that he was gonna uh, throw more skin contact at this, you know, went for kind of a riper style um, uh, for the wine. 
And um, do you have a, can I ask one, one other quick question? Do you have a sense between the Italian and Slovenian winemakers? Is there robust conversation? Is there a sense of stature? So huge, like it is, there's not a, like there, there is a border, but the situation there is like the situation in along the, you know, San Diego Tijuana border before, you know, we started actively border enforcing, you know, that border historically is fluid. People just went back and forth. You know, I had friends in the service industry who lived in Mexico and went to school in Texas before 9-11. Um, you know, that was a, you know, the border, you know, the, the level of militarization that we've become accustomed to at the U.S.-Mexican border is counterproductive, criminal, you know, um, yeah, like morally destitute, all sorts of things, but also pretty recent, um, you know, and, and um, you know, the... It, situation here is like the opposite extreme, super fluid. This wine actually comes from vineyards on both sides of the border. Uh, it's crazy. Uh, so there's there's fruit from the Slovenian wine in the Italian. Um, uh, they only allow that kind of under the table because the Slovene grapes are actually a lot less expensive um, uh, than the Italian grapes. Um, and there have been proposals of a cross-border Carneros kind of situation between um, Coli and Birda but the economics of it don't make sense because of the variable uh, cost of, of the wines because of political vagaries, um, which is which is like really, you know, hugely fascinating. Carlos, have you had either of these wines? Are you familiar with the wines from this region? I'm not, and I was unable to, to find them here in Mexico, to be honest. I did get another uh, Pinot Grillo that was similar, just to yeah. you know, not, not be like Enrique who's sipping rum in the Dominican Republic. <laughs> <laughs> But I, want, I wanted to, to, to comment on something. It's interesting. I mean, this conversation between Slovenian and Italian winemakers, it really doesn't make a difference because it's wine. It's, it's, it seems to me, I don't know the region, but it seems to me like it's one valley with an imaginary line across uh, it. So the, so the difference doesn't really come from the nationality of the winemaker. Yeah. It comes from the philosophy of the winemaker who could be of any nationality. The border becomes irrelevant in that region. It doesn't in, in Mexico um, or in Ensenada and the U.S. because they're so far. This is one valley with an imaginary line across it. And in Mexico, and I agree, it changed in 9-11, but the geographic condition of being, you know, 500 miles away in Napa and 100 miles south in, in yeah, Ensenada yeah. Is, is another condition. Here oh, totally. you have the same wine region and just the philosophy of, of the winemaker. It's not really nationality. No, that's a, that's a really good point because the, the physical, the geographical conditions are not different. Uh, you know, Colio, I think Colio and Birda actually in Slovenian and Italian essentially mean hill. Like it's a hilly landscape that, you know, consists of a series of river valleys. And so there are, there are no, you know, the, you have the Alps on one side and then you have the Adriatic on the other. But aside from that, you know, there are no like physical, you know, significant physical barriers that, you know, lend themselves to ob obvious geopolitical borderline. Um, and you're dealing with European distances, which are, you know, a lot, you know, kind of tighter than, you know, West Coast distances, you know, <laughs> which are just, yeah, a lot. A Absolutely. Lot yeah, yeah. And, and here's, a, here's a fun story talking about winemaking and, and borders. When I arrived, I lived in Ensenada for a while. Hugo da Costa was still the winemaker at Santo Tomas before he started Casa de Piedra. And he did a, a binational project, which was very interesting because he partnered with I'll tell you the name of the winery in, in Northern California uh, when, when it comes to mind. But he did a wine where they would produce half of the wine in the US, half of the wine in Mexico, and they called it it's, awesome. it's still It's still a label that exists, but when Hugo left, the relationship, the, the winery was Wenti, Wenti in California. They did an amazing wine and they invited an artist to do the label every year. Enrique Ciapara, who's a good friend, did, did, did one of the recent labels. Uh, but then when Hugo left and the relationship, you know, was his, they began doing dueto from two different vineyards in Ensenada, which, you know, kind of misses the point. Yeah. What, what Hugo started doing in his new venture at Casa de Piedra was that he continued to do uh, this project with Wenti in the U.S. And, and now Casa de Piedra in Ensenada. He called it Contraste, Contrast. And they bought a winery in France as well, and they did another contrast. So the contrast, contrast and not because it's 
both of the grapes from these two countries blended into one bottle. The wine is amazing. And the other contrast in, is Mexico and France. So contraste, contra, con, contraste intercontinental is US and Mexico. No, it's US and France. And, and the other contraste is US and Mexico. It's really interesting wine and fun wines and it erases the borders, you know? In yeah. a bottle, you're drinking wine that's produced in the US and Mexico on one hand, and the Intercontinental Mexico and France. Amazing wines, both of them. Difficult to find though. Yeah, and I, I think I think you know there's this way in which you know wine itself is a lingua franca. It is this you know mm -hmm. um, shared you know subculture, this shared language that necessarily erodes borders. And you know that, actually, that's a good name for a, a good name for a new new label. Lingua Lingua Franca? Franca. That exists already. Um, uh, oh, really? Yeah, uh, I think uh, I, I think it exists already. But anyway, um, there's actually there's a really cool uh, um, uh, Mexican uh, uh, Mexican winemaker working in Adelaide Hills. He makes a wine called Somos. Um, you would love it. Uh, uh, he actually co-opted the Mexican flag. So instead of like the the eagle with the serpiente, it's like an eagle with like an octopus. Like all these like uh, crazy like uh, Australian, but uh, it's called it's Somos uh, like we are in, in in Adelaide Hills. The wines are banging; they're really good. You should you should check it out. It's super cool. But you know, I thought about including that wine part of our initial tasting. But there's there's just this idea that you know, I, I think there's this like wonderful notion in, in the wine world that everybody shares ideas, and and historically the wine world in the old world wasn't always like that. You know. Um, in Burgundy, people talk about like guarding sellers and stuff like that, trade, like not trading secrets at all, but it's very much like an open source kind of thing now. And, and people get you know, turned on by the idea of wine and that is an international language. And you know, taste uh, is so um, primal. You know, I, I think that it, there's a universality to it that you know, necessarily erases you know, any other when it's at its best. I mean, all that other contingent stuff is always there, but like to taste something and like appreciate it, it's emotional, like taste, smell, they short circuit the cerebral cortex. It goes straight to the limbic system. Like, so we can't help but react to these things on a very emotional level. And, and there's purity to that. And I, I think, you know, it, it, you know, borders are very cortex driven. Like borders are not emotional primal. Borders are, that's like higher order processing. You know, so I, I think, you know, wine cuts through that, you know, wine, you know, supersedes that, you know, it predates that um, in, a, in a really important way that, you know, I, I really adore. And I think that, you know, the, the Slovenian, both experiences hopefully speak to it just, you know, the, I think the, you know, Slovenian um, Italian experience, uh, fascinatingly enough, even there are millions of deaths, is like more of a success story for border relations, whereas I feel like Increasingly, sadly, the U.S. Mexico experience is is gone the other <laughs> gone the other way, um, you know. But there's always opportunity, you know. There's there's opportunity there, and and I think you know, um, you know, looking at the younger generations in in both countries, I think there is you know an increasing willingness, you know, and desire um, to um, you know erase those lines and and experience the best that each culture um, has to offer. Um, I'm going to quickly go through these because. So could, yeah. For the for the for the labor part of 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 the wineries in in Italy and Slovenia is it is it the same source Ooh. of labor? Fascinating question. So um, the labor flows that happen here happen in the old world. Um, uh, it's a little different. So there is a there's a, a broader tradition of working the land in winemaking areas. Um, so I have a really good friend Melanie Fister um, in Alsace. Um, and all, it's, it's really amazing. So, uh, she's kind of, she's in very like far Northern Alsace and it's, it's a little bit off the beaten path, but her picking crew is all the retirees in the village. And if you don't speak Alsatian French, you're not invited. <laughs> it's like, awesome. That's gangster. Like that is like, that's old school. That's how they used, that's how the small estates used to work. Um, increasingly on the production side, it's harder to get younger Europeans to want to do this work. You know, that just happens. Um, uh, the equivalent of Mexican migrant labor there, uh, Poles and Romanians. Um, uh, so within the EU, but you know, less economic opportunity, um, which is fascinating to me because I always hear from particularly the Germans that the Poles are make, 
the Poles are very like religious and like they don't drink as much, but the Romanians are just like fucking wild. So, so everybody wants to get like the, the Polish migrant labor as opposed to Romanian. But um, at any rate, like, yeah, there are, there are labor inflows within the EU that inform who picks grapes the same way they do here. Um, those dynamics are always gonna exist. Um, there's always gonna be, um, you know, a, an underclass and a money class, you know, that, that, that happens everywhere. Um, you know, the, the question is, how do you, you know, do you make, you know, farm work noble? Do you feed and house people in a way that, you know, reinforces their dignity or do you erode it? And, you know, the Europeans have done a lot better than, than we have with, with those questions. Um, all right. Uh, so we're going to close things out with uh, Rebola. So um, uh, Rebola Gaiala. So we're drinking, I should say, uh, I, don't, I don't want, Jason, don't come after me. So we're switching gears. We're drinking now Rebola on one side of the border. So, uh, uh, and Rebola, um, both on the skin. So uh, Rebola uh, Giala and um, uh, Rebola, uh, Rebola Giala and Re uh, Rebola um, in Slovenia, um, more cognates, um, uh, but both on the skins. Um, so the Stekar on the Slovenian side, um, Younger family, grown grapes for ages. Uh, actually, good look, good looking younger bloke um, does the winemaking here. Um, this, is, this is actually not the most flattering picture of him. Um, I, I picked it for the landscape. Um, they're better. He looks better in some other photos. Um, uh, and he has like a really active Instagram account. But um, uh, at any rate, um, that is, um, you were dealing with their uh, uh, Roman Stekar uh, and his Rebola. Um, his Rebola spends 24 days on the skin. So uh, more skin contact than any of the other wines you've had before. And then one of the most iconic wines in the nerdy sommelier pantheon, um, Josko Grobner's Ribola. Um, Josko is one of my winemaking heroes. Um, pull up a picture here. Um, uh, and this is Josko. So Josko, um, you're on the Italian side. But the family, his family, Slovenian. They always spoke Slovenian at home. It's an accident of history that they speak Slovenian. There's stories about the border um, being cut. The, one of the most famous is that a farmer's house was like on the on one side of the border, on like the Italian side, and his commode, his outhouse, was on the Slovenian side. So he had to, you know, pass back and forth to take, you know, to do his business. And then uh, the, the other version of that is, uh, you know. Um, you know, the one cow was Yugoslav, the other cow was Italian, but all sorts of stories. But um, anyway, uh, his family is culturally Slovenian, but um, on the Italian side of the border, but they own land on both sides. Yusko and uh, making wine um, in a more modern uh, uh, style. So Yusko went to viticulture school, comes from a winemaking family, was making wine in Barique, using a lot of, using a lot of chemical interventions, had this come to Jesus moment, visits Georgia, the republic thereof, mind you, um, under the Iron Curtain, um, uh, rediscovers uh, this uh, process of making white wine on the skins, which had existed in um, uh, you know, this corner of Italy and Slovenia. He further rediscovers the uh, tradition of aging wine in clay. So Josko is straddling uh, vessels called Cavevri, um, which come from Georgia, which is the birthplace of the fine wine grape Vitis vinifera that we are enjoying in all of these wines uh, today. Uh, Cavevri uh, means that which is buried in Georgian language, um, which is actually kind of like Basque in that it's unrelated to any other major language groups. Really fascinating, beautiful script, kind of Arabic looking, neither here nor there, um, but a lot of Caucasian languages. The Romans had to travel with all the interpreters when they went there. Um, but uh, Cavevri, that which is buried is this uh, clay, clay jar buried in the womb of the earth. This is what the wine looks like on the skins. Ribola, or Ribola Gialla in this case, aged for five months on the skins in Cabeveri, and then aged for six years in large cask thereafter. Gives you this wine. Um, it's aged in such a way, at such a temperature and humidity level that um, some of the uh, um, water um, evaporates faster than the alcohol, which gives you a higher, um, which give you a beefier wine. So it's 15 and a half percent alcohol for uh, red wine lovers in the mix. Um, you know, this is like the most red wine like in its own own way. You're seeing what the, in Georgian, they call this the cha-cha. Um, in English, we call it the must. Um, so it's the grape skins and seeds at the bottom. Uh, you would, this is the wine, you would rack it off. 
uh, the top. So you just, you know, take a suck on a hose and take it off or use a, use a pump if you want to. Um, uh, historically in France, they would make this into Mark. Um, in Georgia, they'd make it into what's called cha-cha, which is apple brandy. Um, uh, they do the same uh, in, in uh, Slovenia, I imagine. Um, but uh, at any rate, you're left with this iconic wine that he holds back. So this is a 2011 um, wine and singular. Nothing else tastes like this. No one else makes wine like this. It's just like weird entity. And um, I'm sharing it with you. I don't oblige you to like it. Um, my two colleagues uh, at Tail of Goat do not like this wine. It's okay. I think like it's important to have the strength of your own convictions, especially with something as arbitrary wine, regardless of what costs. And this is a hugely expensive bottle that's highly allocated. Um, but, um, you know, I find it uh, beguiling and transformative and you know, um, you know, alien in a really lovable way. Um, but it's also problematic. It doesn't taste like wine in a conventional sense. It's flawed. So you know, it's flawed in a different way that the Vichy is. Um, the Vichy has this mouse taint thing. Uh, the Grobner has this thing that's called uh, volatile acidity, um, uh, which is a little different. But you know, um, it's, it's more like salt. Um, you know, it's not like you know ruining a wine but um bill bill can i make an additional comment yeah yeah the 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 comment that you're making makes a lot of sense because when i was first introduced to natural wines by jair tellez here at Merotoro with with his beachy that didn't even have a label yet jair has a restaurant here in mexico city um called amaya and the the, the you know when you go in it says Amaya, and then underneath it says, good food, weird wines. Yeah. <laughs> because, because they they present natural wines and just and they put them on the table uh, for people to experience. And there's a little weird, at, and there's really weird, and there's stuff that's undrinkable. But there's stuff that, that, I mean, there are natural wines that we are used to tasting, and then there's something that really go beyond what's drinkable. Yeah. yeah. In our, in our definition of things. But the, the, what I've learned in the years that Jair has uh, you know, approached a, a few of us to, to natural wines is it broadens your definition to what a wine can be. Olé, yeah, totally, totally. So, so you drink one of these wines and, and you're like, I'm not really sure, this makes no sense, this isn't what I'm used to. But then you drink something that's in between and you're saying, like, okay, this is interesting. And, and, it, and it broadens, your your the spectrum of the wines that that you can drink and, and that you like and and I become a fan of some natural wines not of all. I, I think, uh, I think but, but the, the 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 message there is that you know try it and then yeah, make yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and and broaden your yeah. your own uh, vision of what a, of what the definition of wine and that's what I think is like Provola you know like try the like Provola try try the wine yeah yeah. I, I do, I love that because I think, you know, sometimes people drink as this escape and, you know, wine, you know, it should be like any other art in your life. Like, don't just binge watch the same bullshit. Like, try to challenge yourself at times, like, you know, ingest media that challenges your worldview. And, and I find for the sake of wine too, you know, natural wine is wine without a net. It, it, it falls, it fails spectacularly at times. But, you know, in a supermarket context, we have been you know, instructed to drink all these wines that are not wines at all. They're just alcoholic soft drinks. You know, they're, they're you know, these engineered things that, you know, happen to be from a grape, you know, but heavily manipulated. You know, I think it is, it's important to define those boundaries for yourself. And it's thrilling, you know, um, you know, sometimes it sucks. You know, obviously, sometimes you taste something, it tastes like vinegar. Sometimes you taste something and it reminds you of cleaning out your childhood gerbil's cage. Like that, that's not good. But by the same token, it makes those moments where you find something that, you know, um, walks that tightrope all the more thrilling. And, and, it, and it, it defines that universe for you in a way that is undefinable if you're just drinking Sutter home all day. You know, it, it, it makes, yeah. it, 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 and, and, and also like a lot of these, you know, um, non-interventionist wines, um, you know, they do, like when they're when they're done well, they do speak poetically to a place in, in, in a really profound way. And they work really, really well with food. Like I one of my favorite natural wine experiences was at uh, Cosme, Enrique Oliveira's place in New York. 
Um, amazing, and, amazing place. Amazing yeah, place. Yeah, yeah, great restaurant. Um, um, and uh, you know, I had this um, uh, this wine from Frank Cornelison, which I, I'd had before, but I had it with that uh, like the duck with Coke that he does, and like the yeah, and and it was just like stupidly good, and it recontextualized the wine for me, and it like elevated the food. And it's one of those, it's one of my favorite like accidents of history. So, you know, you have a chef that is, you know, driven by these like very, he's doing elevated, you know, kind of Mexican comfort food and serving it with wine from Mount Etna. Like what is like more, you know, what is more perfect for a world without borders than that? You know, like that's, that's special, you know, that that's really, that's really amazing and, and thrilling. And I love that. And I do love that about the orange wines too, is that I think um, with food, they're really amazing. Um, you know, they, they bring, they tease out all these possibilities. And if you're at home, I think what's kind of cool about these two is that um, uh, they speak to how tannins evolve. So uh, the wine that is aged for um, uh, 24 days on the tan, on the skins is more tannic than the one that uh, uh, is aged for five months because uh, uh, the, the, the way tannins evolve, it's not, it's not linear. Um, you know, you get to a point where um, the wine itself has kind of uh, saturated, um, you know, more tannins uh, than, than it can possibly, you know, to kind of leach out. And then they start to resolve in a way that makes them less um, acrid or, 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 or stringent um, or drying. Um, and, 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 you know, that's the point you get to for the sake of the Grautner. Um, and it's just a, it's, it's a unique one. Like, again, it's like a, it's a unicorn. Like, you would never start your career as a winemaker and say, I want to make Yasko's wines. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Like he came to it, you know, naturally, um, you know, kind of, um, yeah, organically, but, um, you know, they're, they're super cool. Um, so I'm, I'm going to, we, I want to, I want to take time for questions, but I have a couple of quotes. So, um, this is at the end of the, this whole article about, um, uh, on, on the interwebs, it's from like a random, like wine business website, but it's uh, poetic nonetheless. So, um, about the uh, Italian-Slovenian situation. After a hundred years of bitterly divisive contact, Friuli and Slovenia again gravitate toward each other. Is it a paradox or perhaps a valuable lesson? Common heritage is, is the antidote to political poison. Uh, in a time of division and alienation, uh, culture, wine culture too, straddles arbitrary borders, cohabitation evolves into integration and neighbors end up becoming brothers. Uh, in Colio, uh, wine is not just a drink. It is a powerful, unifying cultural force. And then uh, one more. Um, so this is um, uh, from the same Poetry International Forum. That uh, So this is uh, um, uh, this uh, Mexican writer reflecting on a verse from a Mexican poet. So uh, he says, uh, the borderland is a country itself. I think of these two lines by the Mexican poet, uh, Jose uh, uh, Gorostizo. Uh, no es un, uh, sorry, no es agua ni arena. Uh, la orilla del mar, um, which means the seashore is neither water nor sand. Um, I, I love that quote. Um, uh, you know, I, I think it's it's the it's it's la mezcla. It's like the the combination of both those things that elevates it into something else that can be so much more profound. So, um, you know, I think in the context of you know this lesson, uh, hopefully, you know the uh, the moral of the story being that, you know, we celebrate our, our border regions as opposed to stigmatizing them. So um, cheers to that. Uh, we always uh, close out with a, a pandemic toast uh, alone together or, um, you know, solo we needles. Salud. Preguntas, questions, anybody? Well, I have a quick question. Um, it was very inspirational what you closed with. I'm going to go dark for a second. World War One, World, World War One, World War Two. All that's a lot of that's a lot of disruption in those vineyards. How old are the grapes? How old are the vines in a lot of those vineyards? Uh, younger, younger. Um, yeah. Yeah. So um, the let's see the I think the oldest would be the vines, like Mobius vines. I think are the oldest, and they're like thirty plus years, um, which is always counterintuitive. A lot like in in. I always found that weird in Georgia. So Georgia is the birthplace of wine, but all the all the vines were young because communism, you know, screwed over everybody. But you know, you're dealing with like replanting after communism uh, on the on the uh, Slovenian side, and then on the Italian side, there's just not like a ton of. I don't think there's a ton of old vine. I, I'm sure that there's some old vine source material, but not in Colio, you know, at the very least. Honestly, there's probably more in there's probably more in the Valle. Like there's some old ass vines in the Valle. 
I mean, and in, 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 in Baja in general, it's like old ass Infidel. There's just like, there's some like weird pockets of old wine, old vines there. Well, there's some interesting data there that the oldest wines, the oldest vines planted in the Americas were, were planted in Mexico. The first winery was, was uh, that there's registration of is in Parras, Coahuila. I don't know, I'm just gonna ask Melissa first. So, so I, I had a quick question on, um, on the other border that existed between Italy and Slovenia for a long time was actually the EU. You know, that, that Italy was part of the EU. And Slovenia European. was not, it subsequently joined, and, yes. And, and, so, and so how did, were there differences in the way in which it was, in which the, the wines were sort of, the quality of the wines or how the wines were sort of um, regulated and did that affect sort of how they're going and the trajectory they're going now? Yes, that had more to do with state-sponsored agro kind of, um, business than it did, um, like any trade subsidies or stuff like that. Like, so the Yugoslav program, the state sponsored socialist program was one of collectivization. Um, and, uh, there was no, so the state set the rate at which you sold your grapes to a local co-op. There was no incentive to make good wine. The only incentive was to grow a lot of shitty grapes. Um, uh, and actually, in a lot of those corners of the world, um, people are still kind of skeptical of bottled wine because bottled wine equaled wine that came from the shitty Soviet factory or the shitty Yugoslav factory. Um, the good stuff was just from like a glass demijohn. Or it was just like the home. It was the stuff that you saved for yourself was the, the good wine. Um, uh, you know, so that was, it was, it was like a, it was a, like a market kind of like a, yeah, like a, like a kind of organizational thing. Um, once Slovenia cast that off and privatized, you know, land ownership again, um, you know, I, it, I think it, it just speaks to the sense in which like these cultural traditions are much more durable, enduring um, than you might imagine, you know, um, given the weight of the political forces that you know ostensibly govern them, because um, Slovenia emerged out of that really fast, um, whereas other parts of the Balkans have just you know struggled more to come out of it. Although there's a long history of wine making throughout the Balkans, um, you know Croatia is making amazing wine now, Bosnia makes some good juice. Um, yeah, it, it just it's just taken longer there, um, but I mean they they were also like much more affected by um, you know. Uh, the various wars of independence coming out of uh, the Cold War. Slovenia was lucky enough to be close to to be on Italy's border, honestly, and kind of like far enough away, away from like Belgrade that like um, they didn't endure, you know, that. Um, I, I think it, so uh, yeah, I think it had less to do with the EU and more to do with privatization. Uh, Thanks. But I mean, the EU helps. I mean, like, uh, I think like the shared, you know, I mean, the EU is essentially a borderless entity. I mean, it's essentially like a, it's a confederation of states that, I mean, you know, are more or less variously autonomous than our own states. Yeah. I guess it depends on the state. I kind of wonder what the Florida of the EU is, but we're not gonna go there. <laughs> um, I just wanna say, I think we have, we have a birthday tonight. It's no. birthday, so. Maybe we could all pour our favorite wine that doesn't taste like rats and uh, <laughs> toaster. The non-rat wine. The non-rat wine from Marjorie. Marjorie. Happy Marjorie. Birthday, That's Marjorie. how much we love you. Happy birthday, Marjorie. Happy birthday, Marjorie. Happy birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> non-rat wine. <laughs> I say Tom is, kill Tom is killing it with the emojis or whatever they are. The reactions. Oh, Sarah. Sarah's killing it. Bill, this is largely a group that was able to get together in person and do this without less um, context and more alcohol <laughs> together. So we that we would do a lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I had a question. Can I ask a poll question? Um, who actually really liked the whiskey wine? The, one the whiskey wine. That's a good. That's a good descriptor. I actually really liked it. 
and you all talked about how terrible it was, but I wanted everyone to raise their hand if they liked it because I actually really liked it. I would rather drink a glass of whiskey. <laughs> well, okay, fine. That's 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 fair. That's, 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 that's fair. That's uh, I, I like it better than the one that I thought was like infused with lots of bad mescal until I realized that it was the one that smelled like rats. So which yeah. which one was that? This one smelled like rat because I don't the, think the I had beachy. it. I drank I was drinking the beachy and I was like, yeah. is this yeah. I was getting oh, like oh. a Fritos? <laughs> uh, like a in there? It's not unique. Yeah, okay. That it's one that one's that one's intense, right? You thought it was hamster. More hamster. Yeah, I, I get more. I get more hamster than rats, but um, no. I thought it was like some weird blend of like really smoky tequila. And wine. Like, smoky. I got that too, Robin. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of rats do you have? <laughs> DC rats. The big, the big DC rats. Republicans. Mexican rats. <laughs> uh, the DC I, rats. I, have are, a, I feel like. I feel like the DC rats could hold their own with the Mexican rats. I don't want to. I don't want to undersell our rats. I like that none of us have questioned that we all kind of know what rats would taste like, or mice would taste like. <laughs> I have a question for everyone except Bill. I've never been to Tail of Goat. How is it? Amazing. Uh, amazing. Okay, so next time I go, can we organize something in person? Oh, yeah, that would yeah. be amazing, Carlos. I will say, and, 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 and Carlos, I, I feel like Enrique is the one that you should be blaming because when you came to visit Washington the last time, he didn't tell you to go to Tale of Goat. He did not. <laughs> he went there for Robin's 40th birthday. No, it's, it's delicious, except I will say this there is a dish on the menu that has a lot of mushrooms in it. <laughs> Maybe too many mushrooms. Even if you like mushrooms. Can you have too many mushrooms? What? You can have too many mushrooms. It was the size of a dinner plate. Any and mushrooms is too many mushrooms. Yeah. It was like mushrooms four ways. Yeah. Um, it's a I lot like of mushrooms. mushrooms. But otherwise, it's a delicious restaurant. What What about the wine list? The tough crowd. <laughs> Bill, yeah, Bill, how's, how's the wine list, Bill? It's amazing, right? It's good. It's, it's, it's crazy. Good. I mean, we serve. It's, it's eclectic. It's lovely eclectic. Um, <laughs> I like eclectic. Good. Yeah. Let's do and, it. And, then. For the, and, for, and for those that don't know what what tail up goat is, do you want to tell Bill? Because I think it's a great. <laughs> well, no, it's, it sounds like yeah, it's, it's a weird name. So uh, my my business partners are one of my business partners is from the Caribbean. She grew up in the U.S. Virgin Islands, and there's this expression um, because apparently it's like a really pressing concern between the population of uh, sheep and uh, goats on the island to be able to tell the difference between the two. Mm -hmm. So they say tail up goat, uh, tail down sheep. It's just like a little <laughs> bit of like local Caribbean wisdom. And that was like the non sequitur that we embraced for our first restaurant. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got naming rights on our second restaurant, which is uh, naturally um, a reference to a um, ancient Greek drinking song uh, uh, it's called Reveler's Hour, but that comes from a sculptor was so glad, uh, sorry, says, sculptor was so glad my soul grave for me an ample bowl worthy to shine in hall or bower when springtime brings the Reveler's Hour. See you. I'll put in a, I'll put in a plug, not only for Reveler's Hour pasta to go for dinner, but the sandwiches for lunch are like DC. Thank you. Yeah, so that, that's great. It's really good. That's yeah, our, our car, our, Jason, our car still smells like those sandwiches. Yeah, it's been a pandemic. Uh, so that's one of the things we probably don't make any money on that uh, we're, we're going to continue to to do just because I, I, I like it so much. Um, uh, and, and you know, we've pivoted into like wine store plus restaurant and I'm having too much fun with it to stop. So. Yeah, and I'd put in a plug for Bill, Tail Up Goat, Revelers Hour for 40th birthday celebration mm. and special occasions. Uh, they catered to my plant-based diet and threw an amazing party for me for my 40th. So really awesome. Outdoors. Amazing Outdoors. night. Great night. Wow. Awesome. You, guys look, you guys dressed up. You look great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you look amazing. <laughs> hey, Tom, I'm going to celebrate my 40th birthday there. You should. <laughs> you should. You should. <laughs> That was the last time I wore a belt. <laughs> and so many familiar faces now that people are speaking up. And pants. Yeah. Yeah.
I haven't worn shoes in seven months. <laughs> You're not wearing pants now. No, no I, you have literally, <laughs> you've given us all of our social interaction the entire time. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a virtual I don't leave the goat. house anymore. How am I going to eat at that goat place? Eat outside. They deliver. Hey, Bill, outside. Bill, when Bill, when COVID's over, what's the first place you're going? I'm guessing Mexico City. You really need to get there. I have a lot of places to visit. That's it's, it's, it, it become hugely problematic because I've been able to, it's been fun. It's a fun problem, but I've been able to engage a lot of like wine making friends. So I feel like there are a ton of people that I owe visits at this point. Um, so what's first? The bar at Two Amy's um, is the first <laughs> place. And then uh, uh, after that, I don't know. I mean, I owe the guys, I need to go up to the Finger Lakes and help them with Harvest, but I, I probably, uh, I want to, I want to work Harvest with, uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of weird, like I enjoy as relaxation more like, like manual labor, but uh, um, I'd love to visit uh, Philippa um, uh, and William in uh, Barreda, Portugal, um, mm. and like work a week on the land with them, and then my wife could meet me for a second week, and we tour around Portugal. Well, after you do all that labor that you love to do, <laughs> you're, you're all invited. Mexico City, the, the scene here is amazing. Enrique, Maria Luz, and I can, can host you here. Uh, it's really, really fun for those of you who haven't been. Uh, not only Valle de Guadalupe, of course, in Ensenada, but Mexico City is really going through a, through a good moment. So you're all welcome to come. Yeah, it's fantastic. We'll, t we'll, t we'll, t we'll take you up on that, Carlos. Just, so, Bill, thank you so much for, for, for doing this and for supplying the wines and for supplying the, the, the level of sort of passionate knowledge to this topic. Um, you know, this, this is something that the Terlingua Institute for Border Studies, which, which <laughs> bizarrely is this, is this nonprofit that, that, that Guy <laughs> Nelson and, and Justin Hayes Oh, sorry. Am I muted? No. But yeah. Well, Terlingua <laughs> is this amazing, amazing place on the, and, and I know Robin and Mike have been there, is this place that is, is this totally bizarre place that sits right by Big Bend National Park. It's this old sort of silver town. And when we were there, the, the three of us, it was really a place of inspiration to think about issues around borders. And and to think about all the different ways in which borders affect the way that we perceive, you know, being a natural scientist, think about the way they perceive ecosystems and ecology, but also culture and society and, and, and politics and all the different ways in which we sort of interact with life are actually defined by borders. What's interesting is that COVID itself has actually introduced so many more borders. I mean, we think about social distancing as actually an expression of borders. We think about masks in many ways as an expression of borders. This here, this interface with us rather than being biologically together, we are electronically together, the Zoom itself is a border. And so how we think about thinking about these borders, how we think about overcoming these borders becomes a part of the thinking that we look at. And, and so it's, it's not our day jobs, it's not even most of the times our night jobs, but it's the type of thing that we feel really passionate about. And so you spending this time with us, you know, helping us think through this, with this group, with, with, with others, um, really the role that, that borders play in how we interface with life and how they're evolving over time has really been really valuable. And mediating that through wine has been great. And I'm so happy that the, the attorney for uh, Tibbs, uh, Alex DeMotz is on the line. Um, so he knows that this is a totally legitimate expenditure of our, of our foundation funds. But, but, but seriously, it's, it's been just, it's, it's been just a, a great discussion, a great way for us in our, you know, our sort of extended friend group to be able to interact with each other, talking about borders, talking about wines, I think things that we, we all really appreciate, but, but getting the opportunity to, to think about that with each other is really helpful. And, and for those that are following the Terlingua Institute for Border Studies, because I'm sure you all are, um, we are updating our website and I am <laughs> hoping over time. <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. I know it's important. It's very important. It is. <laughs> But we are, we are updating our website. And are you, are you Heather, on Instagram? Heather, Heather, you, Heather, don't laugh. What are you laughing yeah. at? Heather, you're not on <laughs> people following. Vaughn, Vaughn, Vaughn. Do you mean do you mean you're taking the Latin text off the website? 
the, the Latin text will be. I don't know why the website's technically up. It's supposed to be down while they're it's updating. A placeholder, it, but, it's a placeholder text. Yeah. yeah. Place, but, but seriously, if anybody ever wants to contribute anything on their thinking around borders, please do. You know, provide it to us. We you know one of the things we've been talking about is the fact that it would be really interesting to think about all the different ways in which we experience borders, not just physical borders, but all the different ways in which we, we or, think or, or, or money. Here's the real reason why we invited you all is really we want to ask for your money. But so we spent a lot of money to not- Please send a bond <laughs> check. We're not good business people. That's why we're actually really trying to hold nonprofit. Send right. the check uh, filled but, out to Guy Nelson. Right. Yes, but he's our treasurer. No, um, no I tried to donate. Bill. I tried to donate. I made a successful test donation, apparently. Well, that's what we have to do. It's like getting COVID vaccines. First, you have to pretend <laughs> to register for a vaccine, and eventually you get one. You didn't ask for a credit <laughs> card. Thank you. So we donated thank a million you. bucks. <laughs> Bill, thank you. And, and really appreciate it. And really appreciate the time you took. Bill, Bill, it's run while you can. <laughs> <laughs> Should I make someone else host? Or, uh... Yeah, make me host, Bill. You can make me host. Wrap this up. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks Bill. Bill. That was